Sergey, mashallah. What mashallah. are you doing, babe? Protecting you from devil eyes. Devil eyes? Yeah. You know what? We will talk later. You have to go. Bye. 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 Hey, everybody! Hey! Thank you so much! Uh, but look, I've been told the internet has no attention span, so we gotta get rolling, all right? Oh, it's so nice to see smiling faces. You know, for a while, we didn't know if that was gonna be possible. Now, I'm not saying I enjoyed wearing a mask during that time, but I think if there's one thing we can all agree on is that in America as a whole, uh, we were more attractive with the masks on. I mean, that can't be disputed at this point. If we're gonna have body positivity, I think we need some facial honesty, you know, just... Most of America, from here on up, it's like a beautiful glow. Here on down, it is Quasimodo. It is... And it was always the ugliest people who complained about the masks. Always. It's, oh, this stupid face diaper's covering up my freedom. Like, yeah, but it's also covering up your shoddy dental work, so... Whatever, these colors don't bleed. Well, your gums do. You don't want COVID and gingivitis, relax. But everyone's so angry, that's the problem. No one appreciates insults anymore. Insults are fun. One of my favorite insults that I've ever received was about six months ago. I got done with a show and this guy approached me and the best way I can describe him is he looked like his only possible occupation is sea boat captain. <laughs> like he had a long, thick, scraggly beard, just, just full of regrets and secrets, you know, just... <laughs> he looked like he knew what I did last summer, if that makes sense. <laughs> Didn't say hello, just walked up to me and said, I like you. I said, thank you, sir. He said, what's your name? I said, Johnny LaQuasto. And then he thought for a couple of seconds and then said, if I think of a better name, I'll let you know, and walked away. <laughs> just dropped the insult and disappeared into the mist of maritime past, you know, just... I feel like that guy just does that on the regular, just walks up and ruins people's day for fun. Just total strangers like, oh, so that's your face, huh? Well, you win some, you lose some. Off I go <laughs> to go find the locker of Davy Jones or whatever he does. People are so entertaining. Last week at the gym, I was on the treadmill and the lady hopped on the treadmill next to me. She starts flipping channels and she lands on a replay of the Westminster Dog Show and leaves it. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see her talking at me. I was like, yes, ma'am. She's like, you know what I hate about this dog show? I'm like, you put it on. I don't know. <laughs> She's like, what I hate about this dog show is never in the history of this dog show has a Dalmatian ever won. And I was like, well, you yeah, must have 101 reasons to be angry about that. <laughs> Which would explain the silver streak and the mink coat. So you need to <laughs> get off the treadmill. You got puppies to catch, lady, you know? It's been a very interesting couple of years for all of us. I'll try to sum my life up for you real quick. It's been a bit of a 180. Uh, four years ago, I moved across the country as a single man to work my dream job as a broadcaster with WWE, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I lost it, so... Uh, <laughs> but about a year ago, I moved back across the country without the job, but with the woman I love, her three children, her four rescue cats, her rescue dog, with the kids being age 17, 15, and 11, with the two oldest being girls. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, the pandemic affected us all differently. Some people picked up COVID, I picked up a family. Um, in either situation, very difficult to breathe. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> How do I start every day? Some nice hot coffee with a dash of stepdad anxiety. That's what I got. It is potent. You're not my real dad. No, but you're gonna give me a real stroke. So let's just... <laughs> just try to meet me halfway here. 
And people love putting labels on everything. Uh, someone recently called us a modern blended family, uh, which I found out just means I am white and they're not. That's all that means. Uh, yeah, it, it turns out a blended family is just when you see a family in public and you look at the kids and then look at the parents and say, no fucking way, dude. One of those parents showed up way late to this scenario. And that dad needs to get some sun, because woof. I am so pale compared to the rest of my family. <laughs> In our family photos, I just look like the apparition of a tourist at Disney. I'm like, hey! <laughs> Who wants to go on Space Mountain, Because <laughs> we look nothing alike. You know, I look like me and my wife and children are from Saudi Arabia, you know? Yeah, which is beautiful. Uh, it also means I don't speak their native language, which means now I spend my entire life trying to figure out if they're talking shit about me in Arabic. That's pretty much, you know? Yeah. Every day I see them talking back and forth and they look at me and start laughing. I'm like, hold on a second. Say that shit one more time into my Google Translate, please. It's embarrassing. I'm learning Arabic one word at a time. So slow. Like when I do actually use a word correctly, they just applaud me like I'm a dog doing a trick for a snossage. It's... <laughs> but having an Arab wife is pretty awesome because I don't have a boring nickname like Babe. Nah. My nickname is Habibi. Right. Yeah, you weren't expecting to see a Habibi in this bitch tonight, were you? I love being a Habibi. Just sounds like I should have chest hair flowing out of my unbuttoned shirt. Ooh. And I know what kind of mood my wife is in, depending on how she says Habibi. If she's happy, she goes, Habibi. If she's pissed at me, she says, white person. I'm like, oh. And then she piles it on, like, you big nose, whitey, American. We have fun together. We do. We have a, a lot of fun. <laughs> but I do get a lot of questions, you know. Uh, <laughs> the most common question I deal with, as if it's really any different, people like to say, oh, so what's it like having a wife from Saudi Arabia? As if I'm going to say something like, well, you know, uh, there's always shoes flying everywhere, but the oil money's good. Like, what am I? Yeah, like, what am I supposed to say? She's a woman. She complains. I mean, you know? The only difference is half the time, I don't understand what she's complaining about. That's... But she's a very passionate woman. I love that, you know? Like they say, uh, Latina women are excitable. Uh, well, Arab women are explosive, no pun intended. Um, you know, this, uh, yeah. She's very passionate. Uh, but she'll contradict herself sometimes. One moment she'll say something like, I love where I'm from, I love my people, and I love my culture. And five minutes later, she's like, I don't trust any Arabs. So I'm like, what the <laughs> Is that a warning or a strategy for life? I don't really understand. But very passionate, you know. What I love about Arab women is they don't put up with bullshit. You disrespect them one time, they're done with you. We had to deal with our first horrible soccer mom for our little sixth grader, right? He was in a little soccer tournament, and I had no idea. Before this whole thing happened, I thought the whole condescending soccer mom was not real. But no, these bitches are out there. <laughs> With their clever coffee sweaters and pretending that the PTA actually does some shit, you know, just. <laughs> you know it's true, no one pays attention to what the PTA does. <laughs> But her son made our son cry. I told her about it. Then she went to every other set of parents and told them not to talk to us. Didn't bother me because I don't want to talk to these assholes anyway. But it hurt my wife to her core. And she was almost in tears. She was like, I want to go fight her. And I was like, Ooh. 
I'm like, babe, relax. Remember, we're pacifists. She goes, what is a pacifist? I said, a pacifist means we don't believe in violence to solve our problems. And that's when she says, you're a pacifist. I am a slapping fist. And she just... Yeah. And then she looked towards the woman and said, you come here, you bitter kelp. And she started, which I don't know. I think that means someone's about to get their ass kicked, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> but yeah, you influence each other when you're in a relationship, you know? Like our parenting styles were completely different. Like when we all started living together, I told her, I was like, hey, we never need to yell at the kids. All we got to do is talk to them and we'll see eye to eye and everything will be chill. Holy shit, was that stupid? <laughs> Within a couple of months of living together, I was yelling as loud as she was, except I was yelling the same words. I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> I just followed her lead. I was like, Uksumbala. If you don't move your ass, you Hayawan, you Jesma, you Bagara. And that shit works. All of a sudden, I enjoyed being a Saudi stepdad, man. I felt powerful. Well, you do influence each other when you're married, you know? Like, she's been saying, uh, I'm becoming much more patient as a person. Uh, I say I've lost my willpower. Tomato, tomato. Um, and uh, she, she made me take the five love languages test. All right. I didn't write it, all right? <laughs> I never heard of it before that. Uh, but yeah, it turns out her love languages um, are quality time, words of affirmation, and physical touch. Um, and my love languages uh, were silence, <laughs> alone time, and being emotionally unavailable. <laughs> and that's when she said, those aren't in the five love languages. And I was like, well, they might be top 10. We don't know. <laughs> so until volume two comes out, I'm going to hold off on working on myself. So let's just. <laughs> and once you're with someone for a long time, like you don't go to bed at the same time every night, you know, every now and then you go to bed way later than your partner. That happened recently where like she was long passed out and I got into bed. I just leaned over. I gave her a little kiss on the forehead. Right. And in her sleep, she giggled with such joy and love that I knew in that moment she was not dreaming about me. Has that ever <laughs> happened to anyone? In that moment, you want to wake them up so they can open their eyes and be like, oh, you again, oh. Because I think dreams like that are worse than nightmares, you know? Because at least with a nightmare, you're scared in your sleep. You wake up, oh my God, I'm so relieved. You're having the greatest dream of all time and you wake up, you're like, oh, my life again, son of a bitch. <laughs> and our daughters are hilarious. Uh, the 16 year old got me with a zinger the other day. Uh, she asked me, she's like, well, hey, uh, why do you guys sleep with a fan on at night? And I told her, I'm like, look, um, I don't like sleeping in silence. I struggle with that. So I turn the fan on high and I get to sleep with some white noise. <laughs> and she goes, white noise? I just thought white noise was any time you gave your opinion on something. <laughs> she has no idea she wrote the best joke in my whole special. Um, <laughs> And I don't necessarily uh, recommend planning a wedding nowadays because uh, I don't know if you know this, wedding venues want to take every last penny that you have. So by the time you do get married, you're already ready for divorce. That's pretty much, I had no idea what the cost was. I was acting like a baller before we started pricing everything. I was like, man, we're inviting everyone we know. We're getting two DJs. We're going to blow this wedding out. And then I saw the prices and I was like, well, you know, it's really about our love at the end of the day. And our love doesn't require an open bar. <laughs> so let's just do BYOC, bring your own Chipotle. Uh, 
After we looked at our eighth venue, my wife just looked up at me. She's like, where do you see us get married? I was like, the courthouse. That's, you know. <laughs> this one place tried to quote us $18,000 just for a taco bar. And with a smile on her face, she looked at me and said, would you like to know what comes with the taco bar? I said, unless you say a compass and a treasure map, then fucking no, all right? And then we found our own caterer, right? Beautiful Middle Eastern shawarma presentation, the whole thing. And they said, oh, you could bring your own caterer in, but we charge you $7,000 to bring the caterer in. And I said, all right, well, do you have a Middle Eastern caterer on staff? And they said, word for word, no, but we do have Italian with a Mediterranean flair. <laughs> so are you putting hummus on spaghetti? What does that even mean? And then I got hot, I was like, and by the way, Mediterranean, I'll have you know that all Mediterranean food was actually stolen from the Middle East, and I know that to be true because my wife bitches about it all the time. <laughs> and I've learned not to question her about anything. <laughs> so unless your caterer can whip up some Adana kebab, some shish kebab, some tabbouleh, some kanafa, and some baklawa, then arrivederci, masalam, let's go Habib tea, and we stormed out of there. You learn a lot when you're married to someone uh, not from the same country. I found this out. Emojis mean different things in different parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, my wife happens to have a very big following, uh, especially in the Middle East, on social media. So when we posted our first photo together, all I see are a zillion comments in Arabic. I was like, cool, I don't understand that, but I hope it's nice. And then I just saw a fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji. And I started feeling so confident. I was like, babe, these people think we look amazing together. And she goes, no, that's just them wishing us to hell. I'm like, okay then. I guess all these devil emojis are for me. Okay, good to know, yeah. But what about all the eggplant emojis? She goes, that actually still means penis. I said, okay, good. At least culturally we can agree penis is an eggplant, that's, uh, <laughs> that feels good. Well, you know, we, we do get a lot of questions. They're like, hey, you guys are raised in different parts of the world. You were raised with different religions. And it is true, you know, because she is Muslim. And for most of my life, I was pseudo-Catholic, which meant I didn't go to church, but I still judge people, you know? And, uh, yeah. Once a Catholic, always a prick. That's our catchphrase. Um, it's at the Vatican, you can see it, it's there. Um, it's no picnic growing up Catholic. That was very confusing. The first time they ever shoved the wafer in your mouth, stuck to the roof for about seven weeks. And as a little kid, you're like, what is this? And some creepy adult leans over and says, that's the body of Christ. You're like, does it come in sour cream and onion? Because I can... I look at it this way. I want every possible God on my side. That's the way I look at it. I'm open. You know, you come in our house, I'll put everything up there. I'll put a, a cross out for Jesus, a holy Quran out for Allah, even a plate of snacks, just in case Buddha shows up with the munchies. Like, I'm ready. Even a little E.T. figurine and a $20 bill just to cover us with Scientology. You know what I mean? Just... Yeah. <laughs> And when we all moved into the house together, we wanted to do a little cleansing of the house. And so I said, well, hey, I'll go out and get some sage. We'll do the sage thing. She goes, we don't even have to do that. All we got to do is find a YouTube link of the Holy Quran. We'll play it on the TV while we sleep at night. And I said, that's a cool idea, but I don't know if I'm ready to be woken up by a man chanting in Arabic. I don't know. <laughs> so I went out and I did the sage thing. Cool. A couple nights later, our back patio door just slammed open middle of the night. Could have been the wind, could have been the spirit of a grandma with sciatica, I have no idea. But it was enough for me to jump out of bed scared and I was like, hey babe, you better fire up the YouTube, we're playing the Quran, and that's what we did. The house has been a dream ever since. <laughs> 
It's funny to me because like Hollywood pretends really hard that they're progressive now, but they are not even close. Like there's still a sitcom on television where the premise of the show is a white family and a black family are next door neighbors and that's funny. I'm like, nah, it's pretty fucking normal at this point. Like if you want a real sitcom, please bring your cameras into our house. Where you will walk in the front door, you'll see a prayer rug facing Mecca while I'm on the couch watching football screaming, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then my team scores a touchdown, I turn towards the rug, mashallah. Like that's... <laughs> my team wins the game, I'm like, Allah Akbar. You know, like I'm... <laughs> We got a full house though, we got the cats. Never had cats before in my life. Uh, we have four cats, I've only ever seen one of them. Uh, <laughs> the other three, all they do is hide all day until the moment I fall asleep. <laughs> then it becomes Kitty American Ninja Warrior all over my body. <laughs> I wake up with a tail in my nose, an ass in my eye, I have no idea. Turns out with cats, you have to get used to them knocking stuff over in the middle of the night while you wake up and have a panic attack. That's pretty much... <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like, why do cats have to ramp up the moment we ramp down? You know, like, you jump out of bed, you're like, oh my God, is that an earthquake? Nope, just a couple of tabbies with no goddamn respect. That's all that is. <laughs> cats are brilliant. The moment they see your eyes start to close, they're like, it's time to rave! Next thing you know, there's catnip and glow sticks flying everywhere. You hear them chanting in the living room, wet food, wet food, wet food. <laughs> you get out to the living room half asleep, they're all staring at you like, hey, don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> and we have the one dog, he's gotta deal with the four cats all the humans. Uh, she adopted him, uh, she rescued him when he was like six months old. Uh, she has no idea what he is. Uh, turns out he's a mix of anxiety and insanity. Uh, <laughs> AKA a chihuahua mix. <laughs> if you're looking for a grab bag of crazy, get a chihuahua mix there. <laughs> Look, we can all agree chihuahuas are adorable, but also their eyes are bulging out of their head 24 hours a day. Raising your heart rate just a little bit. Chihuahuas look like they want to tell you a secret and they just can't do it, you know? <laughs> it's like every time you look at a chihuahua, you want to interrogate them, like, what do you know about the Illuminati? They're like... Bruh, 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 bruh. <laughs> I did my research. I don't even know if chihuahuas are dogs. I honestly think they're old white women who have been reincarnated. That's what I think. Um, yeah. There's a lot of similarities. You know, chihuahuas, old white women, both have staring problems. That's a fact. Always peeking out the window, judging you. They're both always cold for no reason whatsoever. Just shivering like it's 87 degrees. I don't understand why I can't regulate right now. You ever see a little 12 pound chihuahua run up to a 90 pound pit bull? Just start barking at it like bah, 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 and the pit bull is staring at it like, is this bitch for real? Come on, that's... So I'm just saying, the next time you see an old lady carrying her tiny little chihuahua up to the ATM, that's not even a dog, that's her sister Dorothy. So... So that's her family. Uh, she took my last name because she loves the last name Laquasto. Uh, she actually said, she goes, Laquasto just sounds so strong. And then I had to tell her what Laquasto actually means. Because someone in my family traced us all the way back to my original ancestor in Italy, Libertine Laguasta. Turns out Laguasta in Italian means the broken.
And you guys know back then, a lot of times you got your last name based on physical appearance. So they got to Old Libertine and they were like, okay, woo, you got some shit going on, my friend. Uh, you're the first ever Laguasta. Wheel him away, please. Get him out of here. But that didn't stop Libertine Laguasta. No, he met a lady named Francesca Latusa. Latusa means lettuce. She was a lettuce farmer. How romantic is that shit? And they had seven kids. That's right. Libertine the cripple met Francesca the lettuce farmer. Did a little plowing of his own and here I am. Yeah. He may have had two bad legs, but he had one good dick. And that's... And that's what it says on our family crest, actually. <laughs> and uh, I'm at a very weird age to where technically, uh, there's a lot of us out there, I don't fall into a specific generation, you know? Like, I'm not quite Gen X, I'm also not a millennial. So it's a little confusing because people ask, like, well, what generation do you really side with? I had to make up my own generation. Anyone can jump on board if you want. I'm the generation that would love to understand what an NFT is, but I'm old enough to have watched porn on VHS. That's my generation. Uh, yeah. We're generation tracking problem. That's what we are. <laughs> but I'm at the age two where it's like, I'm becoming more and more health conscious, but I have friends who are still acting like they're in their mid twenties. Like I have friends still doing drugs on the regular. But now they're trying to play it off. They're like, hey, man, you know, I just do cocaine recreational. Like, I'm like, when you're 25, cocaine is recreational. When you're 40, it's a sinus infection at least. I mean, it's just. <laughs> and they're still doing cocaine off of mirrors. I'm like, at 40, you're doing, why would you do it off of a mirror? Why would you want disappointment staring right back at you? You know, just. And people still want to give you peer pressure when you're a grown ass adult. I had a friend recently say, well, hey, you could do cocaine once in a while, Johnny. It's not a big deal. It's okay to take a risk. I was like, bro, don't tell me about risk. I took my whole family snow tubing without health insurance. All right, I know. <laughs> so you enjoy your snow, we'll enjoy ours. All right, just <laughs> leave me alone. Like, I'm fortunate I've never, I've never had an inkling to ever do drugs, and I honestly think it's parenting, but also, like, I remember the generation that had the greatest anti-drug commercials of all time, and that was back in the 80s. Yeah, they terrified you. I don't care who you are, you've all seen the most famous anti-drug commercial ever, all right? It was the frying pan, and the eggs, and the brains. Any questions? It was awesome. But that hit me when I was so young. I didn't understand the message. I thought the eggs were the drugs. I was all kind of confused. <laughs> but my second favorite anti-drug commercial ever, this one's so underrated, right? It starts off on just a dark screen and you hear a guy's voice say, one out of every five people who try cocaine get addicted. And then it pans out and there's a beautiful young blonde woman just snorting a massive line of cocaine. And then the voice kicks back in. But that's not your problem. Or is it? <laughs> and that camera pans out and that same woman who just snorted the blow is driving a children's school bus. Woo! <laughs> Which is the most unrealistic commercial of all time. Because if that beautiful woman driving the school bus was hooked on cocaine, then the lady who drove my elementary school bus was made of cocaine, all right? I don't know if you guys remember school bus drivers in the 80s. But back then, I don't think you were allowed to drive a school bus unless you looked like you should never be driving a school bus. I vividly remember my kindergarten school bus driver. This lady was a beast, all right? She had like a Brian Bosworth flat top up to here. She looked like a bad guy from Lethal Weapon. Does that make sense? Like, she looked like Gary Busey. It was weird. And she had a gap tooth that would make Michael Strahan do a double take. Like, oh, fit, like that's how big. And her right arm was bigger than her left arm from cranking open that big door, you know? 
Never knew what day it was. She would crack open the door. Happy Friday. I'm like, it's Cocaine Tuesday, Brenda. It is Cocaine Tuesday. <laughs> well, you know, she got the job done. So, I don't judge anyone. My life is very weird. Uh, I mentioned working for WWE earlier because I'm also a play-by-play -play commentator, right? And uh, yeah. Love doing play-by-play. -play. I'm very proud of it. I've worked in professional wrestling for 13 years. And, you know, when it's done right, pro wrestling is the greatest form of live entertainment on the planet, you know? But when you tell another adult that you work in professional wrestling, a normie, uh, <laughs> every single response is always, oh, you work in wrestling? You know it's fake, right? <laughs> So's The Bachelor. Shut up. What's your point? You know? Everything is fake. You know the Pirates of the Caribbean movies? They're not real pirates. In real life, Captain Jack Sparrow's wife pooped in his bed. And he had to take her to court to get revenge. So let us enjoy our stories. But I also do play-by-play -play for combat sports, for boxing and MMA, and I, I love being a play-by-play -play commentator because it's such a unique skill. Not many people can do it at a high level. And especially in MMA, I have such respect for the men and women who fight because to do what they love, they have to live with cauliflower ear for the rest of their lives. That's crazy to me. Like if someone said to me, hey, you can have your dream job, but for the rest of your life, you're gonna look like you're always wearing Beats by Dre. I'd be like, ooh. I think I'm just gonna learn how to do taxes because... <laughs> so the least I could do is try to call a great fight for them. But every fight is different. Sometimes you get great fighter versus great fighter and it's historic. But a lot of times you get a great fighter versus someone who's about to get beat real bad. <laughs> and that's the magic of being a play-by-play -play commentator. You have to make that guy sound credible. So this is usually how it goes. Like, all right, guys, Joshua Taylor is making his way to the cage. Taylor coming in tonight with a record of three wins and 17 losses. 17 losses via knockout and three wins via miracle, apparently. But you can't count Joshua Taylor out tonight. He is very dangerous. He has amazing directional awareness. As you can see, he really knows how to walk straight toward that cage. And over the course of his 20 professional fights, Joshua Taylor has proved that he is not afraid to be punched in the face over and over again. And what makes Taylor so dangerous tonight is he has nothing to lose because he's already lost everything. And that makes him a real wild card. And as you know, a wild card always has a puncher's chance. And that's how you do that. Yeah. And then 17 seconds later, he gets knocked out like Glass Joe in Mike Tyson's punch out. So it is what it is. Like I said, weird life. On top of all that, I have a physical therapy degree. <laughs> Yeah, healthcare people, I love you. Yeah, they are. I don't do it much anymore, but it was funny when I was a PT, half the people didn't even know what that meant. Like I would say, yeah, I'm a physical therapist. They'd be like, oh, so you can give me a massage? <laughs> Not if you ask me like that, Jesus, no. Where'd you get the baby oil? Put it down, dude, like what? And every healthcare professional will tell you, we see some amazing and insane people. Uh, one of my favorite patient stories, um, I was walking this guy around the hospital because he came in with elevated heart rate and high blood pressure because uh, he also had cocaine and methamphetamine in his system, right? And I'm walking him around the hospital to see how his heart reacts and he goes, you know how I got the cocaine and the meth in my system? I said, I have an idea, but why don't you tell me? He said, well, I recently moved back in with my mother and yesterday I was drinking my morning coffee and my mom must have put the cocaine and the meth in my coffee. <laughs> and I drank it all and I couldn't tell. And I was like, sir, if you drank coffee with cocaine and methamphetamine in it 
and you couldn't tell, <laughs> then your mom needs to take that recipe to Shark Tank immediately. <laughs> Because that is a can't-miss episode. <laughs> Imagine those four billionaires just twerking in their seat, all jittery. They go, oh, this coffee's got a real kick to it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Where's this coffee from? Colombia. Okay. <laughs> is it a fair trade coffee? There was a transaction. Greatest episode of all time, by far. Yeah. Another patient I had very early in my physical therapy career, I was working outpatient. And this lady came in hammered drunk every single appointment. And all she ever wanted was electric stimulation on her low back. That's it. On top of that, she had a southern accent and kind of sounded like a female version of Cleveland from the Family Guy. <laughs> and she was also very loud. So every single time she would come in and be like, hey, Johnny, can I get the stems on my back today? I'm like, yes, you can get the stems. And then I would put the stem on her back and she would become more and more orgasmic as I would turn up the stem. So I would turn on the machine and she's like, okay, Johnny, you can turn up the stem. Oh, okay, Johnny, just keep turning up the stem. Oh, Johnny, keep turning up the stem. Oh, Johnny, keep turning up the stem. Oh, Johnny, can you turn the stems around to the front of my body? I'm like, where? She's like, by my pussy. I'm like, no. Your workman's comp is not gonna cover that, all right? I learn a lot. I learn a lot with her. And I love taking advice from people because I need it, you know? I have no idea what I'm doing. But one thing I have learned is that it's the simplest advice that honestly works the best. Best advice I've gotten is never go to bed angry. It's genius. It works. Every single night, I will make sure I never go to bed angry. Yeah. Which is why I pass out the moment she gets pissed off. Because I... <laughs> I'm not going to let her attitude ruin my REM sleep, all right? No. You might be surprised to hear this, but I'm not perfect either. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not good at dirty talk. It's not my thing. Uh, I think it's because I'm a PT. I'm too much of a realist. I don't like playing pretend. I don't know how to role play. Like, I, I just don't know what to do. Like, if she whispers seductively, like, what are you going to do to me? I'm like, uh, I'm going to keep you safe. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to cuddle you, but only after consent. Like, that's as good <laughs> as I can do. Like, if she comes at me aggressive, like, are you ready to handle this? I'm such a nerd. I'm like, well, I'm going to give it the old college try. And I came prepared. I have bananas and coconut water for cramps and hydration. And your desire for an orgasm is at the top of my to-do list. So don't you worry because Habibi is here. <laughs> but I'm happy, you know. I was single for most of my adult life, I think honestly because I, I was told I was too nice for years. Like, I'm so glad it's finally in to be a nice guy because women made it very hard on nice guys for a long time. We would always hear the same stuff over and over, right, buddy? We'd hear, oh, I'm sorry, you're just too nice. Or, oh, I'm sorry, you're kind of like my brother, you know? <laughs> or my favorite one is, oh, I'm sorry, but nice guys finish last. And every time we're like, well, we'll also finish on your back or on your tummy, so just... <laughs> Give us a chance. It's awesome dating a nice guy because we have no expectations. You go on a first date with a nice guy and you just give him a little peck on the cheek. We feel so good. We're driving home listening to Return of the Mac on repeat. We're just like hitting the high notes. Oh my God. Like we feel like kings. Like I'm so glad it's in to be a nice guy now because the bad dudes, now they have to watch their P's and Q's in public, you know? 
Like if you walk up to a woman and you're right in her face or you're overly aggressive or whatever, a lot can happen now. You know, you can get called out on social media or you could even be arrested. Or you could even become president. Like a lot can happen. You know? And before anyone gets butt hurt, that's a bipartisan joke, all right? Because you don't know if I mean the current guy or the last guy, they're both old and creepy. We can agree on that. Yeah. As someone who's worked with the elderly for 15 years, one thing I can tell you, no one over 70 should ever be president ever again. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things old people can do. The most important job in the world is not one of them. Like, how am I gonna give you a nuclear code if you can't program a DVR, you know? Like, how are you gonna handle a 20-hour workday if you can't navigate stairs? I'm just saying, there's a lot of things old people can do. If I walk into Walmart, you fucking wave at me, you know? But if someone gives you a red button to push, it better be the easy button from Staples, that's all. <laughs> but I really appreciate you guys being here. And I think for me, the, the take home message of the last couple of years of my life is really that uh, in, in a relationship, in a marriage, you really do uh, balance each other out, you know? Um, because my wife, she lives for romantic moments. And I live for ruining romantic moments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, recently, we were in bed. The kids were all asleep. And we were just talking. And we were looking at each other in the eyes. And she said, you know, after everything we've been through, with how tough it is, would you still marry me again? And I said, yes. Absolutely, yes. Because our kids are amazing. And you're the most beautiful, brilliant, creative talented soul I've ever met in my life. And also, I really needed material for a new special. And that's when she said, that's okay. I really needed a green card. And that's what we call a win-win. Thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate you so much.